of God. We're going to call this reigning in life in Christ, enjoying the newness of life. How to enjoy God. I mean, sometimes it seems a lot of Christians are battle weary. I mean, I've talked to them some years back. And I, I remember well, a lot of people were going to prayer meetings and now they're going back to prayer meetings. But I think they got a, a different perspective. Back in the prayer meetings, we're battling and fighting and battling and fighting. But you know what? If all you do is battle and fight, couldn't you get weary? And for intercessor, I've taught a lot of intercessors that you don't fight all the time. You fight with God's weaponry and it, it's not burdensome. Say burdensome. I said, Jesus come, said, come unto me and my burdens are light, right? My yoke is easy, my burdens are, there you go. All right, so we're going to be reading our scripture, but before we do, this one's called Enjoying the Newness of Life. Now, how many here are new creatures in Christ? You've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I'm working out a new leg, and it's, I'm testing all of it out, so when they put my brand new leg back together, it's going to have all the little things worked out. So if I wobble a little bit, just imagine Pinocchio. But my nose will never grow because I don't lie anymore. Did you ever do that, Pastor Kerry? I don't know. I probably did. You know, so don't judge me. Okay, so let's go on. I'm having fun with you. All right, so we're going to go to John 14 as our overhead scripture. But reigning in life in Christ, enjoying the newness of life. Amen. So in John chapter 14 gives us a description from the words of Jesus. And he said to his disciples and also to us, because God's no respecter of persons, most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, will he do also. Now everybody goes, who lives in you? God lives in us. So why couldn't we let God out to do the same works? There you go. You see, in Acts chapter 3, we're going to go back to that in a minute. I won't lose you. It says, Peter and John said to the man, silver and gold, we don't have anything to give you. In other words, what you're looking for isn't what we have to give you. And you know, a lot of Christians today are looking for some way to meet their need every other way than going to God and letting them meet that need spiritually or physically or do a miracle for that. Can you say amen? We will do that because we know our Heavenly Father. And he says, so what I do have, I'm going to give you. And they laid hands on him and they imparted Jesus to them. What did the man do? He probably sat there and wondered if he was healed. No. Peter grabbed him by the hand, lifted him up, and says, go walk. And the guy went right into the dead church, the frozen chosen, you know, the high steepled few people church, and where nobody moves except for the ivory up the wall. Anyway, he ran into the synagogue, and they're all seeing the man that was laid there for years leaping and jumping. This is who we are. The works that I do shall you do also, and even greater works. Why? There are more of you carrying Jesus than were back then. Say, I have Jesus. The answer to every need. The problem is we don't give him away enough. Now listen to a trick. The Lord tells me that the devil is getting some of you to focus on what you're not getting and why you're this and why that and how come you this and you that. Be careful of the big eye. The big eye is what Satan fell from. I will, I will, I'm going to, I will. No, we are going to surrender and let God live through us so that we can. Say, I can. Look at your neighbors say, God doesn't dwell in can'ts. He dwells in cans. Amen. All right, so then it goes on. Because I go to be with my father. Now, not only is Jesus in us, but he is the right hand of the father, full authority. So you're connected, Sam, connected. So don't be afraid 
to lay hands on a sick person. You got a loved one? Say, I really don't know what I'm doing, Jesus, but you said to lay hands on them in Jesus' name. Can you do that? See, I can do that. All of us do that in one way, probably. And if you haven't, it's great fun. When I first got saved, I learned that. I saw my pastor do that. I saw other brothers and sisters say, you can do that. I read it in the word. And so I started looking for people with sniffles, with headaches. Now, don't laugh at me. And so I could go over there and see Jesus heal them. And you know, to my utter amazement, he did. In fact, if you ever have a migraine, come and see me. We'll snap it off your head real quick. Whoa, that sounds spacey. No, there's a good way. God developed my faith in praying for others that way. You know, you have to exercise your faith for it to develop. You can't sit and wait for your, your faith just to work. That's God's faith in you. You have to exercise your faith so you stretch. You can believe for things and don't sit and, and just surrender to circumstances. Say amen. All right. Just believe everything. God wants us to get better at everything. Amen. And not to remain the same. I found out even the best of water becomes stale when it sits. And whatever you ask, now listen to this, but put it together. The works that I shall do, you shall do. Because I go to the Father. And then he says, it's just simple math. And whatever you ask in my name. See, he's not... He's not considering us struggling over God keeping his word. When he talked to his disciples and said this, now listen, his disciples seen him multiply bread, do miracles, walk on water, pull coins out of fish. And when he said, all you need to do, gentlemen, disciples, ladies, is to ask the Father in my name. What's hard about that? Nothing. Only when you inject your head. Because your head is so used to being involved in everything. Look at your neighbor and say, yeah, big heads are a bummer. <laughs> there you go. You guys are working right along with the program. Here we go. <laughs> it says, whatever you ask in my name, that will I do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Now, did you see, whatever you ask in my name, that will I do? Where's Jesus? He's in you. So you ask him, and it might not happen immediately, but he's working on your behalf. Isn't God working in you? You see, we don't sometimes see all the pieces come together. But if you remain this, under this kind of teaching, you will. Because then you'll see that it's really the only thing up to you is to believe God, to ask God, and let God work. Hello? Now, if you take a little seed and put it in the ground, you don't go out there and go work, 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 seed, work, work. You don't dance around it with some Indian dance or some, some rain dance, unless you live in California. But I'm, I'm just, you know. You see, we don't work the seed. The seed works. We don't work the seed. The seed works. But you got to get with the seed program. And stop speaking against your seeds. And we do. We don't mean to. We've been conditioned to be double-minded. Switch. Now listen, here's, here's the thing. Let me confess something to you. Sometimes I appear as holier than thou, and I'm not. I have made a lot of mistakes in my life. One thing I appreciate is friends. I appreciate brothers and sisters that love the Lord, and that's you. And it's so, so sweet to have a family that loves God. Amen. You know, and I want to let you know that in my life, starting when I first got saved, all of my personal friends, all of them, except for a few, very few, who were my friends, the enemy's been able to take them away. So what that did to me is it got me guarded. So let me apologize to you. If I seem sometimes, 
you know, official and all that. I'm really not that way. I want the best for you. And if you're like, you know, not doing the best and you're just sort of gliding around, somebody like me might say something. That doesn't mean I don't like you. Do you understand? So look at the fruit, con concerning the fruit. What am I doing? How Pastors are like that. So just kind of consider all pastors that way. And it's not easy to be a pastor's friend, so please don't be a pastor's friend. Be a pastor's strength. You know what I mean? Strong and, and backing. You know what I mean? Don't promise people stuff. Just do it as God leads you, and then you won't get yourself in trouble. I thought you said you were going to do this. Pastors hang on words of people. Did you know that? All right. So let's move to the next beautiful scripture in Mark 16. Again, dealing with our, our enjoying newness of life. Mark 16, 15. And then he said to them, you know this one, something going on behind me? Everything's there? Okay, cool. I don't know. I just heard, heard, a, heard a phrase. So. And he said to them, go into all the world. What did he say? See, this is the problem with the church is sitting still. They're arguing amongst themselves, and please just let me kind of, you know, get on the apple box. And they're all divided up. I can't go to this church because this, that, and all this. God doesn't want us all entangled like that. He wants us following. Just go to the church God tells you to do. Be dedicated. Watch things grow and operate. Can you say amen? And he said to them, just go into all the world and preach the good news to every creature. I sit on my backyard and praying for all everybody, and the birds come up, they land on me. Not all the time, so I'm not, you know, Moses or something. Landed on me, come ate seed off, you know, the squirrels coming up, and I'm thinking, Lord, it's so sad that mankind broke away from you when the animals did not. And I said, so they're in touch with you, and they don't even need to pray, they're just in tune. We need to pray because we broke away. And now we have to return by our will every day to, to ensure not our salvation, but our growth. And I, I was just sitting there and I'm saying, Lord, this is absolutely beautiful. And of course, I told you about my bird, how I asked God to do something with my bird to see if she was connected to it. Boom, bing, 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 you know. And so listen, you have Jesus in you. Let him out, let him take over. Become like him. How could I do that? Step back a little and become like him. And when you start to get agitated and nervous, that's when there's a little wrestling go on. Learn to surrender that and keep in the spirit of realms. And he said, go into all the world, preach the good news to every creature. He who believes and is baptized, born again, shall be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. See, this baptism doesn't mean water baptism. This means baptism into Christ. That's born again. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. That's what we're studying. Most people don't know that. They don't have their doctrines quite set up, and I'm sorry about that. But the dentist, notice it didn't say believes and baptized, and if you don't believe and is not baptized, no, it says believeth not, is condemned. Verse 17, and these signs will follow those that believe. How many believe? then don't be afraid to try these things. It's God in you doing the work. These signs shall follow them to believe on my name. They will cast out demons. Don't let a devil harass you. They will speak with new tongues. You got your language? Use it if you do. Don't be ashamed, but use it with wisdom. 18, they will take up serpents. In other words, you'll handle the devils that are working with the people and the problems of this earth. And if they drink any deadly thing, anything tries to deceive or poison you, the term uh, poison does not mean only liquids or food. It means to poison your outlook. Look what the devil did to Adam and Eve about the tree and poisoned their outlook about God. Oh, no, God's hiding things from you. God's hiding, and you'll, be, you'll know that if you eat this, you'll be like God. 
Same lie hasn't changed. And if you're not close enough to God, deception can be something you don't want to taste of. Say amen. It's the fruit of unrighteousness. So they'll take up serpents if they drink any deadly thing, be any kind of impulse of deadly stuff. It shall not hurt them. Hello. And they will lay hands on the what? Did it say you have to have a lot of faith? Did it say jump around? No, it just says lay hands on the sick and God will cause them to recover. You don't just, he said, look, the Bible says I'm to lay hands on you. You're not feeling well, so will you let me pray? Yes, pray, Father, in Jesus' name. You said you will heal them. Thank you, Father. Now, just say, by his stripes, receive your healing and start, start thanking them. And usually, boom, they get healed instantly. Not always, usually. Now, why don't some get healed instantly? Let me let you in on a secret. If you're older in the Lord, you've been with God longer, you're expected to apply the principles better. And those that are brand new usually get miracles and healing right away because it doesn't take any of their faith or what they know at all. They're just believing. So sometimes our habitual unbelief slows down the manifestation of our healing. Therefore, watch your mouth. Seeds come from the mouth, both good and bad seeds. Actions, watch them, because both bad and good seeds come from action. And so if you're having a problem stopping negative seeds, talking about negative things you shouldn't, talking about everybody's brokenness and sickness, stop that. You need to pray for a crop failure. What do you do, Pastor Kerry? Every word that I spoke... This last week that was negative, no faith, God, I neutralize in Jesus' name. And Lord God, pump more of your spirit in the great seeds, the right seeds in Jesus' name. Can you do something? Can you pray something like that? We were taught that very young in our life, in our Christian life, that, that our life is full of good and bad seeds. We pray the bad seeds die out. We do Feed those fields with bad seeds. Say amen. Nobody likes weeds nor thorns and stickers. All right, so let's get in our lesson. All right, we're going to cover four areas. And it says, okay, in that scripture it says that the Lord went with them, confirming the word with signs following. And so listen, it isn't you trying to conjure up healing. BJ, God put healing in your hands. Every time you're to lay hands on, your hands are going to light up and feel warm again. You haven't been applying that gift, and God wants to encourage you to apply that gift. There are people there where you live is sick. Lay hands on them. God will shield you from getting sick. Okay, all right. You've got that anointing in your hands. All right, we're going to cover these four areas. A born-again believer, what it really is to be born again. We hear about it, we talk about it. Even the Mormons are using that phrase. And some of the Jehovah Witnesses use the phrase because they know Christians are supposed to know what being born again is. It's not so much being born again is what do we have as being a new child of God. Secondly, we are, to secure, we are secured in Christ. We are not need to be, oh, God, shield me, hold me with my right hand, lift me up. You're all talking Old Testament there, and it's all good. But where does God live? You see, we have to get our changing from the outside in, from the inside out. In other words, if we just read, now don't get me wrong, if we just read the Old Testament and not enough New Testament, You'll see a lot of God from the outside working on the children of Israel, which will, after a while, give us the impression God is out there somewhere going to work a miracle for us sometime, someday. And that's okay, except in the New Testament, God's in our boat. Can you say amen? He's right here. So it doesn't have to come from out here. And you've, if you want to get a chance to study this, some, Romans 10 tells us, who shall say, 
God come down and who shall say, God, come up? What saith it? The word is near you, even in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which you preach. So we're not getting God to do anything. We're believing God to get out of the way so God, what he wants to do, comes to pass. Say amen. Delight yourself in the Lord and he shall. Come on. Delight yourself in the Lord and he shall. Give you the desires of your heart. Are you delighting or somebody distracting your delight? All right, say, I love you, Pastor Kerry. So th thirdly, we must keep ourselves in him. No one else is going to keep you in God. You have to want to keep yourself in him. And it comes time in a Christian's life where you're going to be tested. And not by God. The enemy, remember, he's got our number on a few things. And he waits patiently, and he's going to burn eternally in hell. So he's going to wait patiently to see if we don't open up a good, broad door. He has to have a big door. The devil has to have a really big door. He can't just jump in a slip of a confession or jump because you're having a bad week. He has to have a big door. It has to be a habitual door that stays open so he knows that... He's got that number whenever he needs to hit it. You see? And so he'll wait patiently, God forbid, till you go ahead and start slipping into that, and then he'll bash you. That's why Pastor Kerry and Linda, we try to encourage you to meet with God daily, first thing, just a, a small checkup from the neck up so that you're covered and you got his wisdom. And by the way, in that wisdom, he can alert you when the enemy's close by or the tricks he might play on you, or a bad partner, or a bad situation might be on its way. He can stop that. Can you say amen by alerting us? Say amen. And then fourthly, how to enjoy God's good life. Did you know Christians, I haven't seen too many. I can remember 20, 25 years ago, Scott, you know, full gospel businessman, this is the happiest people on earth, the exciting, what happened? Our eyes slipped off the king who brings the happiness on the happiness we have. And we slipped to the created thing instead of the creator of things. Satan's a master at stopping revival, getting people's eyes off of Jesus, stop meeting God every day. You see, during a, what we call a tent revival, it goes on for a couple of weeks. And the people get going and get going and get going and get going. And then when they go home, they only live on what little knowledge they have of the word, which isn't much. So they go into a tailspin. This is not how God wants us to grow. He wants us to come to a good church, one like this, where you're going to be precept upon precept upon line upon line. Oh, and it's going to seem sometimes to your mind very boring. And you go, oh, you better do something, man, because there's no singles here. Well, bring one. <laughs> Why are we always waiting for somebody to do it for us? Listen, you need to build your church. Your job is to get people here. What are you doing? That's not my job. I'm already charming. Let's move right along. <laughs> All right, let's look at point one. Can you laugh with me? All right. I look at Linda, she's not laughing, I know I'm in trouble, right dear? All right, so listen, point one. The born again believer, let's just look at this. You know what John three, let's go to John three, look at verse one through three. We're not gonna stay long there, but let's look at this. There's some really beautiful things I wanna bring out. There was a man of the Pharisees. Now a Pharisee were those that love the, 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 the big pomp and ceremony and all that. And they always kind of put extra rules. If you're going to belong to this synagogue, you're going to have to shake my hand twice every, every Saturday. Whatever. They would put rules on things. Jesus called them out. But he says, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, teacher, we know that you are a teacher from God. I got the hiccups. For no one can do, listen, these signs except for you or unless God be with him. And of course, we know Jesus did signs. 
And look at how Jesus answered him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say unto you, unless one is born again, he cannot see. Now, underline that word see. It means to perceive and know about, rather just to see physically. You won't be able to see or know about or perceive the kingdom of God. Why? Because a natural man cannot receive the things of the spirit. The next scripture, go with me, Romans chapter 6. Here's a really good one. And he goes, oh, do you not know that as many of us that were baptized, everyone say baptized. Remember, baptized means to immerse, totally soak into, baptized in Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk. Notice the term should. It's a choice. Every day you have to make that choice by going to God, helping him steer you. Because during the night, somehow we kind of flip off. You know, we get out of, out of sync. And so I always check in, always. So I don't get out of sync. And if I go on a vacation, I don't put God on the, the banister. God, I'll get back with you next week when I come back. <laughs> and hey, let's go on. Okay. You're baptized also into his resurrection by the glory of the Father. Even so, we should walk in newness of life, knowing, verse 6, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him and that the body of sin that set Satan nature in you might be done away with that we should no longer be slaves of sin verse 7 for he who has died has been freed from sin likewise you also just like this you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Verse 12, down to verse 12. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. That's why we present ourselves before God every day, so that that sin part doesn't rise up during the day and we act like a ding dong. God forbid. Come on, laugh with me. And obey its lust. Remember, all of us, all of us especially you single people, you have great need. And if you don't go to God about it, that need will rise up. And don't be condemned either. God's well aware of what Satan did to the human race. Our job is to relate to our Father so he strengthens us so we don't have as many weak moments. But even in our weakness, God is strong. Can you say amen? amen. And so it goes on further to say this. That we are to present ourselves members. What are we to do with ourselves? We are to present ourselves members of instruments of, of righteousness rather than unrighteousness. Did you see the word present yourself? You see, I think people get away with that. They got away from the whole idea of, Lord, I come to you in Jesus' name. It's like, God, I know you know me. You already know what I'm going to ask before I ask. And we do one of those things. God doesn't want to hear your brain, nor your excuses. He wants to hear your lips, and he wants to see your tears. He wants to see and exercise your spirit so he can do something with it, so that it can expand and the anointing of God can work, so that when you lay hands on the sick, they recover. Say amen, you old wine bag. What? That's what we are. We're expanding our wine bag. We have to keep it rubbed down with God. And if we don't, when God wants to use us, we're just going to crack. Now, I want to point out to something. I believe in giving honor to whom honor is due. Do you guys remember a, a lady named Catherine Kuhlman? She was one of my teachers, okay? And she taught me a lot about the anointing, just watching her videos. I did not sit under, I just missed one of her meetings before she passed. But I sat under a lot of her teaching. There's a new lady out. And her name is Catherine Crick. 
and she's from either New Zealand or uh, Australia. Now, people call her an apostle. I don't call people names like that because that's not fair. Now, she might be, she might not. That's God's business. But she's out there preaching. And you know the message she has? Just like here. Very simple, basic. And hundreds of young people are running. And I think it's the appeal that she's willing to get out there and start preaching. Book yourself a place and go preach a, me uh, a meeting. You know? The Bible tells me I'm supposed to give you the wisdom of God so that you go and influence others. And then those you influence, influence others and influence others. You know, I want to influence you that you go influence others. Can you say amen? All right. Look her up. She's okay. I mean, I'm, you're not going to get dazzled by a lot of teaching. She's more like a Billy Graham. But the anointing's on her to break people free. All right. Are you with me? So look what it says. Therefore, don't let sin get out of control in your mortal bodies. A couple of points. Number one, church, the born-again child of God is a new type of being. You're not the same person. We got born again. So who lives in is God? But what we forget is we're mixed. God in us, us in God. Didn't Jesus say, so that you know that the Father be in me, and I be in the Father. So God is in you, and you are in God. It's called the mystery of godliness. But unless you're really focused on that, you'll walk around like our, the old person. I'm just me. Well, yeah, but you're not just you. You're a new creature. Say, I'm a new creature. I have God in me. So the, here's the thing. You can't walk around like you used to anymore. People sure can identify, and don't, don't be something you're not, but you're not that person anymore. You've taken out the old man and put on the... So don't try to play the game. Don't be the chameleon. You're a different person to different people. Two, to be born again means that God relit our spirit. Now here's what a lot of Christians don't know. God purposed for all of us to be perfect before him in love. He purposed for all of us in the beginning for Adam and Eve to be perfect and all of his descendants, us, be, to be before God in love so he could come down and visit his planet and his creation and enjoy it. But we know Lucifer messed that all up and Adam sinned. Hello? So now we have to return to our father by the act of our own will because it was an act of a human will that we tore ourselves away from God in Adam. We didn't do it personally, hopefully not, but Adam did, and that was passed on us, the separation. Now catch me. So being born again means that you're a God type of being. And so... The first thing you need to do is renew your mind. You need to reprogram this computer we have because it's going to keep playing the negatives. And if you get around somebody like Scott or me, who are men uh, like Linda, my wife, and we'll just mention Peggy, lots of all of you. You get around people that really believe in God, it's convicting because here we're just speaking all about the stuff that we normally speak. And we're overdoing it. And we're not having nothing in check. And you get around somebody who's doing their best so that they can move in power and to stay in the spirit. And it's just like night, night and day. What in the world? And so that person that's walking with God will look and say, what are you doing? And they'll get mad at them. They'll start to, they'll be all mad. Why? Because the person that's acting like they used to is not applying what they should do. You have to apply the scripture. Nothing else works. It's what you don't hear. It's what you catch. Thanks, Scott. You can keep it. You have to catch it. Draw it near and practice it. Catch it. Draw it near and practice it. You're a born-again believer. If you don't do that, you'll slip back into your old man. 
Slip back into the old person you used to be, and you'll find you get angry and frustrated and mad at everybody. You don't want that because that makes you open game for Satan to whack you. I don't mean kill you, just slap you around. He doesn't want to kill you. He just wants to beat you up so you'll hate God and hate other Christians. Kind of sound familiar. God forbid. And for those of you younger, don't worry, you have Jesus. So we'll move on. Okay, my second point. We are secure in Christ. Do you believe that? I like to call it Christ is our tank. I sure, if you, once I remember the Sherman tanks came out, they were so huge compared to the other ones. The you know, Germans had their whatever tank, and we brought our Sherman tank out. Now they got ones that are all computer run. They got ones that they're practicing with. Am I supposed to say this? They don't even have to have anybody in them. They're all computer run. Huge machines. Now, the point of me bringing up a tank is that's who you are in Christ. You're in Christ. Did he win? Come on, did Jesus win over the devil? Yes! Well, why does the devil get so many victories? Because people aren't applying the word going to God. They're just simply living like they are living, cursing, mad at each other. You got to get them to church. They got to hear somebody go to tell them some good news, what to do. I mean, it's kind of like standing around looking at a tank and say, what do I do? Get in it, son. Get in it. Don't be afraid of it. It's not religion. Get into Jesus. Let me show you how. So, if any man be in Christ, he is in you. So, the tank is it being in Christ. The devil has been stripped. When Jesus said it's finished, it was finished. He went down into hell, took the keys of death, hell, and the grave, wiped them out. And stripped him of all of his authority and power. And all Satan's got is a squirt can of lies. It looks big, bullhorn, but he, he's a lot full of lies. Come on. And so, don't get out of the tank. And what does he use on us? He says, oh, you're a lonely man. I got just the girl for you. Come out of the tank and go dating. Now, there's nothing wrong with dating, but make sure God's directing it because the tank will go with you. Hello, come on, let me play with you a little bit, okay? You're in a tank. You have all the weaponry, all the power. You are shielded. You, have, you can move over things. You can take over land and control, and his name is Jesus. What, what do we have in Christ? Well, we have a covenant. We have forgiveness. We're filled with a new creation type with God. We're a type of God type being. We have the angels. We have the covenant. The, we have the blood. We have everything. What does the devil have? It's been stripped. Just the lies to make you feel, to give him whatever you feel sorry for the devil, maybe. Run him over. Just, just keep trucking for God. Keep going. You don't see anything. You don't see anything. No, but you perceive to keep forward. See, you won't perceive or know fully the kingdom until you're born again. And when you get born again, you've got to stay in the tank, in Jesus. You have to keep yourself in Christ. Do you believe it? Well, look at what Psalms 18, verse 2 and 3 say. The Lord is my rock and my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom will I trust? My shield. Wow, aren't we covered here? Everyone say tank. I'm in a tank. Now, here's the key. I'm going to give you this piece. God gave it to me this morning. It says, in the Old Testament, people weren't in the tank. They were invited to get in the tank. And when God needed them, he said, get in the tank. I'll protect you. Go do this. And to get it all done. And then they turned back into the same old person. quiet Because they didn't have God in them. So it was like that piece of cloth, that new piece of cloth that you want to put on your old pair of jeans. 
And you can't put that old new pair of cloth on the old pair of jeans because when you wash it, the new cloth will shrink up and pull away from the old pair of jeans. That's the Old Testament. God will use us, use them, but every time they got carnal, he pulled away like a new piece of cloth. But in the New Testament, it's an entire piece of clothing. His name is Jesus. So the idea is, well, Pastor Kerry, you mean I have all of that in Christ? Yes. Well, how do I go about that? Just go about it. You get up that way. If you think anything is out of kilter, say, Lord, cleanse me. And if you love like I do, and I know you do, to spend time with the Lord, spend as much time as you can with God, just getting his presence and filling up. Can you say amen? Get that extra charge in your phone. Going back to you are in Christ. And he says, look, he is my shield, my horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Does that show any weakness there? And that's Old Testament. Jesus wasn't in their hearts. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. Now they have that protection in the Old Testament. What kind of protection do we have in the new? Church, God has made a way for us. Every way that you can imagine of escape. Remember it says, when temptation comes God will make the way of escape. He doesn't say a way of escape. He says the way of escape. And the way of escape is Jesus. And the idea is to focus in on him and let Jesus become your eyeglasses as the spirit leads us. And remember, we're in Christ and Christ is in us. Get up in the morning and start thanking him for that. He'll make it such a reality. You'll find that faith is automatic and that you're not trying to believe God. You don't have to worry when you come around somebody like Pastor Kerry and he's going to correct your confession. I, you know, I really apologize for if I've ever made you feel a little bit intimidated. God forbid. It's not, it's not what I want to do. I, I want to bring you and show you that sometimes we got a lot of holes in our bucket and there's no water anymore. So we need to tighten that up. Who can we do that with? We go to God and we get that done with God. But we also, iron sharpens iron. And each other keep us in check. Can you say amen? How about, is there somebody here, here or not here that you haven't called, that maybe has been on your heart you haven't seen? Make sure you follow through with those things. Because Satan will play guilt trips. And we don't want no guilt. Say amen. We must... Be a doer of the word to have this kind of security. You have to do the word to have this security. You can't just, oh, I'm protected by God, and boom, a Mack truck hits you. You can declare something, but without doing the declaring, then it will never seat. The rock is hearing and doing the word. Hearing and doing the word. The rock gets bigger and bigger the more you hear and do. The more you hear and do, it gets larger and larger. It makes room for your movement. It makes room for your victory. For not only is he your rock, but he's your fortress. He's your shield. He's your buckler. He's your sound strength. And he's your big tank. And the devil goes, come on out, Carrie. Let me shoot you. I remember your past. Let me bring it up to you. What? Oh, okay. I just told him, I don't want to hear my past. I'll tell somebody else and they'll bring it up to you. You know, there always seems to be those people who know something about you. They think they know, they don't know. Don't let people do that to you. Can you say amen? The only thing I don't know about myself is my old man. I got rid of him. Say amen. Every day, getting rid of him. All right, let's go on. One more scripture with this. Psalms 91. You know this one. This is talking about being secure. Now, remember, we're in the New Testament, so this is still old, so it's even greater than this. He who dwells in the secret place. That means walking in the spirit. You like to dwell with God. Why is it a secret place, Linda? Because Satan can't go there. 
He doesn't know where that place is. As soon as you say, Father, in Jesus' name, you are shielded and covered. Wasn't I before? Not necessarily. If you've been talking negative, thinking negative, you know, a little of us slip out there, just get back in the tank. It's kind of like standing up. You, you know, the equipment's really great. Looking through Jesus is really great, but you've got to peek for yourself. And it's okay because you'll notice people stand up in the tank and they look and give commands from the tank. Can you say, and that's okay. But stay in the tank anyway. And so all you have to do is duck and not climb back in it. And what I'm saying is, if people don't know how to walk with Jesus and if they would just, we would just learn, you stay in Jesus, stay walking with him, you meet with him, you walk with him throughout the day, interchange your conversation, and your life becomes very rich, very secure. Why? Because you're not double questioning things. You're not doubting so much because the presence of God drives away doubt. If I can get you in the presence of God, you won't have a doubt until that presence starts waning. And then your old man starts to doubt again. That's not terrible. Just go get another dose of the Holy Ghost. Get soaked again. You see, we are to bring ourselves to God. We are to secure ourselves in God. He doesn't do it automatically. We had to come to Christ, surrender to Christ. We have to stay with Christ. Say amen. But if we do, he does all the rest. That's marvelous. I notice a few of our lights are flickering and dancing. You know, that's God saying amen. All right. So let's go on. So Psalms 91, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. That means influence. The word shadow there means influence or kingdom. It's a far reach for kingdom, but influence is a better translation. And I will say of the Lord, he is my what? Oh, God, where are you? No, he is my refuge. What is a refuge? That's a place where you can vacation. Have you been to your favorite vacation place? And just recated? You could do that. Go on a vacation and bring God along this time. Don't be troubled over anything. God will love you to play. Here's, here's the thing. I have to confess this. I was talking with Scott last week, and I thought he was saying he was going to take a couple of days and go on a vacation. So I'm praying for his vacation the whole time I thought he was gone. What a brother, huh? No, he didn't do anything wrong, but he got an extra dose of vacation prayer. <laughs> well, Lord, let him have a good time. Let him relax, enjoy things, unwind, you know, and I'm going on like that. Well, I guess that's love. And then come back. I says, how was your vacation, Scott? He says, oh, I'm not going yet. Oh. So it shows us that maybe I ought to pay a little more attention to my brother when he talks. All right, moving right along. Come on, laugh with me. Notice, I will say of the Lord, he's my refuge, my fortress, my God, him will I trust. Now, dwell, imagine the tank. Let's go on to our next point. We must keep ourselves in him. This is, a, this is the key. A lot of Christians today get so wound up, and I'm not trying to pick on anyone. We get so wound up in our problems. It could be good problems. We haven't got enough done for the house, you know. We got to do this, and I got to make up some time for job, and everything seems to be entangled. God doesn't want us to be that way. He wants us to go to him and let him level all that out so it flows more. Do you believe that? God wants us to flow and be in rhythm more than, than jerked around by circumstances? I should say. Look what it says. We keep ourselves in him. Psalm 17, 8. I love this. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me under the shadow of your wings. Here, God has wings. I tell you what, have you seen a, a, a bird pull the chicks in? Oh, it's nothing like it. And, and then verse uh, uh, 27, verse 5. Psalms 27, 5. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion, 
in the secret place. Remember, we just got through reading that. Of his tabernacle, he shall hide me. He shall set me on high on a what? Rock. Who's the rock? Amen. You submit to God and he'll set you on the rock. Amen. And then a couple of points. We, therefore, as many as read the scripture, they talk of full protection. Now, I've been saved a long time. I never knew that a Christian could have full protection. I thought we had the cheap insurance. Come on, laugh at me. You know, that's what we thought. I thought we had cheap insurance. So, you know, if I turn my back and the devil is going to put a dart in me, you know, all this kind of religious ideas. But no, we got the full protection. Can you say amen? amen. The benefits are out of this world. Jesus Christ's mutual life. Amen. So now we're in the New Testament with even better protection as we keep ourselves in God. See, it's up to us. It took Adam and Eve to leave God and her man's harassment all these years. Now it's up to us to accept his son and to be with God so he can restore us. And you'll read the prophet Joel chapter 2. He'll restore what the enemy's stolen from us. Amen. I have scars from my past, but I have no pain. He's taken all the pain. Aren't you glad? I'm glad. Amen. So, remember that the spirit of God is where Satan cannot be. So that's why he keeps us, trying to get us in turmoil. That's why we have to keep ourselves in God so we maintain a, tra a tranquil spiritual setting. Why? Because we're hidden in Christ. We're hidden in God. That means Satan can't, while we're in that realm, he cannot throw anything at us. He cannot touch us. He can only lie to our brain. Oh, you're not all that. Think about poor me. Look at what you did all your whole life. And then you dwell on it. And guess what? Your eyes are on you, not God. Uh-oh. Don't put your eyes on you. You want to get depressed quickly? Think about all the things you don't have, all the things you could have, should have, would have. If I only, only. That's so self-centered. That's so wrong to think that way because that's what Lucifer did to fall. He probably was feeling sorry. Oh, you gave this world to Adam. You didn't give it to your prize angel. You see, Satan thought this world was going to be given him. And you can read about it in Hebrews chapter 1, where God says, to none of the angels had he given this earth, but to the Son. Adam was called the Son of God before he fell. And Jesus is called the last Adam. And you and I are sons and daughters of God. Say amen. All right, let's see if we can wrap some of this up. All right, listen to what Colossians 3 says. Notice the word hidden, verse 1 through 3. If then you were raised with Christ, yes, we're born again, seek or go after those things which are above. Spiritual things, things after God. Why? Because that's where the blessings and the wisdom is. Where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind, in other words, have a mindset on things above, not on things of the earth. Why? Because all the things on the earth are changing. They're like rumbling and stuff. And if you put your faith in man too much, that person might make a mistake, break your heart. So you do trust men and you love people, but within the love of Jesus. Can you say amen? That way, if they do something wrong or they, hurt, they won't hurt you because you're in the love of Jesus. All right. And it says... Sitting at the right hand of God, set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth, for you died. There's the key. Say, I'm dead, but I've never been so happy in my life. <laughs> because really, every day, the old man is dying out. You're not going to take this. It's getting older. But if you go to God, 
follow the word, go to God like Pastor Linda and Carrie is sharing, and do that. Your youth will maintain. You're waiting on the Lord. And it says those who wait on the Lord shall be renewed. So if I can get you in the presence of God and dwell with the Lord, your youth, you'll be able to accomplish things more because you're getting back into what God designed you for, to be spiritual and operate in the spirit because Satan can't touch you there. He only touches you in the soul realm and in the flesh realm. He can't touch you in the spirit realm. Notice he couldn't go down into your spirit and pollute your spirit. No, he can't touch any of that. That's what Satan wants to hide from you, that you're so well protected. You don't believe who you are. You've got to believe, confess, declare, and say, thank you, Lord. Because where you died, your life is hidden with Christ in God. Hidden from the devil. In Christ in God. You are sealed. That's why I believe that God will keep you and Satan can't take you out of God's hand so easily. We're going to read that here. You ready? Let's go on. And I want to make sure I get everything down here right. Okay. Look what uh, 1 John 5 18 says. Now, this is very important because it involves us doing something. We're to bring our body a living sacrifice. We're to present ourselves before the Lord. 1 John 5, 18. We know that whoever is born of God, that's you and I, does not practice sin. In other words, we don't let our flesh out of hand go out there and do all the wrong things. We keep ourselves in check. We go to God. Everything's in check. Does not practice sin. Does not sin. Because God's in you. Remember the new creature? God in you can't sin. And you and God are now one creature. So really, it's not in your heart to go do something wrong. It's in your head. It's in your flesh. That's why when your head gets to dwelling about something kind of, woohoo, might be just kind of fun, you dwell on it long enough, you'll follow that. Where a man thinks, he often will follow You died, your life is hidden with Christ and God. We know that whoever is born of God does not practice sin. And who has been born of God keeps himself in Christ. And the wicked one does not what? Come on, say it like you mean it. Does not touch him. What does that mean, Pastor Kerry? Cannot touch you. What does that mean, Pastor? It means cannot touch you. Isn't that good news, Becky? Verse 12 says, in James chapter 1, verse 12, listen to this. It's talking about overcoming. We're overcomers because Jesus is in it. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. As long as you're in this earth, you're going to be tempted. As long as you get in the flesh, you'll be tempted more. Jesus said, pray that you enter not into temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive a crown of life, which the Lord promised to those who love him. What's being approved? You don't give in to the temptations and the lies of the devil. Why? Because you and I live in a tank. We'll just point your gun at him. His name is Jesus and blast him. Don't get out of the tank, tank and try to slap the devil. Just because you're macho. Stay in the tank and just blast him with Jesus' name. Then it says, let no one say, and everybody does, not you though, that when I'm tempted, I'm tempted by God. God is putting me through a test. God did not put that tree in the garden to test Adam and Eve. Because God does not tempt anybody, especially with evil. Was that tree evil? So don't listen to those that say, yeah, God put that in, in the garden to see what Adam and Eve are going to do. Well, if you believe that, then you think 
everything that comes your way that's a temptation, God's allowing that to get you away from who you are in Christ. A double-minded God is unstable in all his ways. Stay in the tank. Get away from religion. Bring people to where they can hear the truth. People follow Jesus because every time he opened his mouth, he told them the truth. Do you believe there was a time that Jesus didn't open his mouth? Yeah, because I think there'll be a time that some people can't bear the truth. In fact, he did say that, didn't he? He says, there are many things I'd love to say to you, but you can't bear them now. I'll be it when the spirit comes, you know, all right. So he goes on. Now look what it says. I love this. It says in John 10, look at 9 and 10. God does not want us to be deceived. So it says that if we get tempted, the whole purpose of that temptation is to create sin back in our life and get us troubled and full of condemnation. How many here know God doesn't want us to do that? And even if you do fall, get up and go to God. Don't dwell on it. Don't say, why did I do that? Why, oh, why? Because now you're in the soul realm, and that's where Satan loves to play chess. And he's a master at winning. I am the door, he said. Isn't Jesus the door for life? Yeah. Now, how do we know the difference between right and wrong? Who can tell me? Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. In 1 John 5, I mean, excuse me, 1 John 1, verse 5, this is a message that we've heard from him, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So we're assured that when we would dwell with God, we're full and surrounded by light. Say amen. In fact, back in the days of Samaria, Christians were known as the shiny ones because they had the light of God on them. And the ones that weren't serving God didn't have the light of God on them. They weren't shining at all. He says, I... I am the door, and if anyone enters by me, we have to go through Jesus every day. Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. Father, I ask you in Jesus' name. Anyone enters by me, he will be saved. And we'll go in and out and find pasture. What does that mean? Gives you your freedom to go and choose. Why? Because you're not going by yourself. You're in a tank. So everyone say, I'm in a tank. He's Jesus. And I, I say that illustration because I was talking to someone who really knew they were so beat up in the Lord. I said, you really need, need to know who you are because then you won't let the devil try to talk you into beating you up like this. Hello? Well, I can't help it. It's this. and It's my husband and it's that. And it's none of those things. You are out of the tank. Get back into the tank. Come on, laugh at me or with me. So we know that I am the door. If anyone enters by me, we'll be saved. We'll go in and out. But the thief comes to do nothing but eat, to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you might have life and have it more. But there you go. There you go. Everything that steals, kills, and destroys is not God. Everything that adds life, helps you, makes you better. Every, in fact, let me say this, every major invention in the world that's helped mankind through the very beginning has all been a, a gift of God working through man. Everything. All the bad stuff, we know that didn't come from God, did it? And you, human beings are right in between the two, making choices which day they're going to serve and to whom. So John 10, verse 27, listen to this one. Are you secure in him? Say, I'm secure in him. 
Oh, yeah, and there are times you're going to feel like he's not anywhere around. Feelings, don't trust that stuff. Look what it says. My sheep hear my voice. Say amen. And I know them. God knows you. Oh, there, they, there goes Carrie wandering away again, doing his own thing for God. I'm making that up. My sheep know my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Say amen. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. So can the devil take you out of God's hand? You guys need to read that over and over again. Satan can't come into your living room and snatch your kids away if you're putting them in God's hands. The key is it's legality. You have to put what you have in God's hands. You have to die to self. Get your head out of the way. Put more of a childlike faith and watch God work on your behalf. You almost thought I was going to close, didn't you? What does Psalm 23 say? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down. The word make is an interesting Hebrew word. It means if you were broken or somehow you injured yourself, he would lay you down in the grass and pick a little bit and put it in your mouth and make you chew, 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 chew. It actually means that. I mean, how humiliating. But for a, a sheep that's maybe not ill or not feeling well, maybe they are, haven't been near food, the shepherd's going to care for them. He lead me beside still waters. I used to always tell him, why still waters? I said, well, still waters are easier to drink from. Then I had this one guy who was going to be a smart aleck. He says, yeah, still waters. Run deep, right? I says, yeah. He says, still waters don't run at all. <laughs> I said, there you go, and being negative again. No, he leaves them where, where they're safe. Sheep soak up the water, and they'll pull them right over and drown them. That's how smart they are. They need a shepherd. And so why did God liken unto us as sheep? You got it. No emphasis needed there. Amen. I shall not want. He maketh me to lay down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He lead me in paths of righteousness. He restoreth my. And you know the whole thing. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. New Testament, for God's in me. I'm in the tank. God's in me. I'm in the tank. Well, why then is things kind of all upset? Because we're trying to apply the way we used to apply to deal with them. So go to God, say, Lord, this is out of hand. I don't know what to do about this. And God says, great, step back and I'll give you the wisdom. How many has ever had that happen? Well, sure you have. Go back and check it out. Then it says how much he cares for you and I. He says in this scripture, you have prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house or in the presence. Old Testament would be the house where the presence was. In the New Testament, in the presence of the Lord. That would be your prayer closet, maybe your house. Could be church forever. When we get to heaven, whose presence are we going to be in? Amen. So let me ask you something. Do you like dwelling in the presence of God? Because when you get there, that's what you're going to be soaked up. You can enjoy a good dose in presence of God every day. Just go to God every day in the morning with your cup of coffee and say, God, here I am. Father, in Jesus' name, today I'm going to live through you. Let's have a perfect day, God. Let's have a perfect day. Oh, come on, Pastor. No, if God's in charge, you'll have a, I've had many pretty perfect days where there was an ache or pain or a problem. I took a guy out and I says, Brad, Brad, if you're listening, that's great. 
and we went out on his route. I said, Brad, let's have a perfect day. So we held hands and prayed. I believe in, you know, being sincere. And I asked, God, show Brad we can have a perfect day. We, three people got saved. Some guy kind of come up behind us, was blowing his horn, and was going to, was the devil. Of course, in people working this out. And they were trying to run us off the road. And I looked at him, I said, watch this, Brad. And Brad looks at me, he's got his cowboy hat on, you know, Brad. And um, I turned around, and I looked at him, and I said, Jesus' name like that. Man, it was like I threw a brick at him. They slowed down, kind of did this. I don't know what they saw, but you have a lot of power in Jesus' name. And see, we need to be in prayer so God can encourage us to utilize his weaponry, to stay in the tank, to walk with him, enjoy life. He's going to have you have fun. Then when you're visiting with your kids, your kid's going to say, hey, Grandma, hey, hey, Grandpa, What's that I feel around you? He's kind of like, wow. Yeah, let me tell you, it's Jesus. Would you like to have Jesus in your heart? Yeah, and my arm hurts. Would you pray for me, Grandma? Start doing those things. Well, I have to be asked first. There you go with you again. No, you don't. In fact, you're probably not doing that. It's probably hindered your children from growing. Hey, let me lay hands on you. I learned today at Sunday school, this is a good way to get you guys. <laughs> Amen. Did you get anything out of that this morning? Was it a blessing? Give a little praise. <laughs>